the death of the college experience. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, uh, Cal State has announced that they will not be resuming in-person face-to-face classes in the fall of this year on warnings from health authorities that there may be a small resurgence of the coronavirus pandemic in the summer and then a major uh, wave coming back in the fall. The 480,000-some students at, in the Cal State University system, which comprises about 23 campuses, I believe, Um, will be continuing to do their education online, which they've been doing since March uh, in these virtual settings. Uh, Cal State is the first major American university to announce such a plan. And Bill, it occurs to me uh, that this, if it continues and if other universities follow suit, could constitute the death of the American college experience, but perhaps the rebirth of college education. What do you think? That's, I, I've been saying this for several years now. Uh, well before the, the uh, pandemic, I've been saying that colleges are done, that, that, that uh, you know, brick and ivy colleges are finished. And the reason that they're finished is because they do not provide an education any longer. They are now schools for indoctrination where you come out stupider than you were when you went in. And to pay $120,000 a year or whatever to go have your kid Come out stupider than when they went in. I've they've been they've been finished for four or five years now at least. I think irretrievably finished. So um, all the this uh, COVID nineteen thing is doing is speeding up the process, and that means that if you graduate with a degree online from um, UCLA, let's say, it's probably not nearly as good an education as you would have gotten if you went to Phoenix University online. Well, you know, Bill, they can continue doing such things virtually. I mean, the indoctrination process, look at the New York Times. There you go. Now, college, of course, is an experience, as you say, the college experience. Uh, and even that is under assault. Uh, it's true that these, that these, I mean, just regular colleges like my University of Florida, unbearably, unbearably uh, politically correct, social justice warrior, uh, you know, kind of kind of thing. It's hard to square that with, uh, you know, with having fun on a Saturday afternoon, football games, and then, uh, you know, because that's violent and competitive, and and uh, and and I'm sure it's patriarchal too. And and then you go out on a Saturday night, and, you know, all of it, all of it, the fraternity system, the sorority system, it was all under enormous pressure from progressives prior to this pandemic and for the university systems to basically fold the cards like this is going to show people that the education is not what they're getting at college. And uh, and I think it, it might be the last hope of of saving the, the university experience because I think it's an important experience, very important. Why but, is that? Uh, what is so important about that face-to-face interaction, the living away from home, and like you said, the whole social life, the intercollegiate athletics and all that? Well, I hope our younger members of our audience are sitting down or, or, or at least braced, uh, uh, you know, next to the, uh, to the safe room. But the thing that was for me in 19, between 79 and 82, or was it 92? I don't know, 12 years of college down the drain. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the most remarkable and memorable thing about my college experience was hearing people with completely different viewpoints and having to deal with them and have my mind actually expanded and, and, and realize that a lot of the things that I believed were due to the perspective that I was coming from and that there were other perspectives on the issue and that I'd never heard anyone advocate those positions before. And so the exposure to uh, entirely new ideas, not all of which I agreed with, probably most of them I, I may not have agreed with, but they all got my attention and they all forced me to think about things and they forced me to challenge my beliefs and to learn how to defend them. And if I couldn't defend a belief that I previously held, then I would move off of that belief onto one that I could defend. And this is the antithesis of what college is now. College now is a place to protect you from new ideas. And and this is why you cannot get an education at a university. You Your only chance today, and I'm not exaggerating, when, when universities, students are, are threatening to burn down buildings because a gay conservative wants to come and give a speech one evening, or a Jewish conservative, or if the faculty or the management, the administration of the university says, oh, he's a conservative, 
well, we can't really ban them, that would look bad. Why don't we just make sure that we charge them a $15,000 security fee so that they can pay that out of pocket? And, and, and there you go. Colleges or universities and colleges now are places to go to isolate yourself from any new ideas whatsoever. They're anti, they're anti universities, they are anti learning centers, they're places to go and get dumber. And this pandemic is hitting at, at a time when I think the entire world is on the, is on the verge of, of understanding this. So what I mean by this, Scott, is this. Used to be that if somebody said, I have a degree from Harvard, a law degree, let's say, that used to mean that this had to be probably the best student, one of the best students in the country. The admission standards were so high, the, the demand was so high, this, the, the, the rigor of admission was so intense and the, and the classwork was so intense. Now, if I run into somebody who says I have a degree from Harvard or I'm attending Harvard, I say to myself, so what does that mean? Does that mean you got to use the crimson safe room? Does that mean that you that you were able to protest in in you know in in such a posh facility? What did you actually learn? Did you go? Oh, you 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 were you're a Harvard graduate and you majored in gender studies. See, I don't see how a Harvard graduate in gender studies knows more about gender studies than a person who takes gender studies at Miami Dade Community College personally. Uh, and, and so they have no one to blame but themselves for having degraded the reputation that the entire idea of a university diploma uh, used to mean. And, and there's another factor in there, but I'll take a breath. So well, you seem to be I suggesting don't. that in some way things could get better without this so-called college experience face-to-face -face interaction. But everything that you're talking about there, I see happening online every day. So I, I don't see how the... Um, you know, Cal State, for example, not being able to have 480,000 students come to their 23 campuses is really going to affect the ideological content of the education. Do you? The people, the people who were leftist indoctrinated prior to Cal State, and Cal State's a great example for this, are not suddenly going to become conservative. But if it turns out that that their experience in college comes down to four or five hours a day on Zoom in a class, then their total exposure to this environment of, of progressive nonsense is cut significantly. And the peer pressure is way, way down. Um, so that's, that's generally good for people. What they're gonna find is, they're gonna find that if they're gonna try and charge people anything like, and I mean anything like the numbers that they were charging for tuition, then they're gonna to have to do some teaching if it turns out that what you're paying for is the actual education and not the community center and the dorm rooms and the sororities and the fraternities and the protests and the, and the, and the sit-ins and the, all of that stuff. If it turns out that, that, a, that now uh, Harvard University or, or, or Cal State or the University of Florida, let's say Gainesville, University of Florida, Gainesville shuts down, no more students there you are going to have to justify the amount of money that you're spending on an education no longer by saying, well, we got this great campus and, you know, we would like to have a university that the football team would be proud of. And uh, all of all of this stuff uh, is suddenly off the table. And then all of a sudden you start to realize, OK, so now we're talking about 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year, which I've always assumed was being paid for my child's education, but I also knew it was going to parties and football games and all that stuff that's very important. If it comes down to the fact that those campuses are closed and all of these extracurricular activities are suddenly off the table and universities want to maintain anything like what they were getting for tuition, then they're gonna to have to do nothing but serve up education. In other words, Scott, if you've got uh, a world where everybody's studying from home and you have uh, four one hour Zoom meetings in order to get geology, you can't really spend the first 25 minutes of that one hour geology meeting talking about how evil Trump is. Because if for no other reason, people will just drop out of the Zoom rather than get up and walk out of the class, which, which has social proof consequences. Uh, in a case like this, it just simply won't survive it. So it, this could be this could be something that comes at the eleventh hour and saves the universities. But the key thing, of course, the key thing here is is twofold. Number one, 
for decades now, you did not have to go to a physical university to get a university level education. The, the level of education that you can get online is absolutely phenomenal. If you have the discipline, it's the best education in the world. No question about it, number one. And number two, we are rapidly moving out of a world where certification has the, 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 the cachet that it used to have of any kind of certification. I'd still like to have engineers and doctors with, with degrees, but I don't really much care uh, about business managers. I don't much care about, you know, large numbers of people who attend university to get a degree in something. I, I was a theater major. And you want to talk about an ironclad guarantee to a life of riches and ease, boy, a theater <laughs> degree. But, but using theater as using theater as, a, as the farthest out example of what I'm talking about, because I understand that it is the most useless of degrees. And the most likely to have to be in person to experience yes. that. Yes. Yes, but but from its economic value, okay, it's pretty near the bottom. In fact, I, I can't think of anything less financially valuable than a theater degree. Now, this is an important point. I learned a lot uh, when I was when I was a theater major. I learned a lot, and and the foundation of all of my storytelling skills and directing, working with actors, all of that, I learned in the theater department. But no one has ever hired me on the basis of my degree ever. Ever. And no one who's being hired over the hill there in, in Hollywood, when you go to an audition and you hand somebody a resume, they want to see the work that you've done. They don't particularly care if you got a, a, an, M, an MFA in fine arts. Irrelevant. Say your lines and, and can you do it? Yes or no. And, and that attitude is rapidly spreading to the rest of the population, to the wider population. It's, it's more and more becoming a, a, a gig-based thing where we're in more of an independent contractor world, despite the best efforts of California to, just, to, to fight the inevitable. And what people are looking for now is they're looking for ability. They're not so much looking for credentials. They're looking for resumes. That, when I say a resume, I don't mean a, a, an educational resume. Portfolio. Uh, portfolio, exactly. In, in show business, uh, we would say an, an actor or a director or whatever writer, we'd say, it's, this is my reel. Let me see your reel. Here's six minutes of the best work I've done. And you, you start out with a reel that's six minutes of junk, and then you get something better, and you take two minutes off the bottom, and you keep taking the worst stuff out as you do more and more stuff. Presumably, you get better and better. Your reel improves, and that is your calling card. And this is happening all across the board. There are innumerable accountants now. Just to take an example, it's about as far away as you can get from theater. Uh, there are innumerable accountants who simply work online. They simply, they simply post their services and people take a look at them, maybe have a talk with them. And they, and they do the work from home, and that home could be in Ukraine. I've hired a couple people in the last several days to work on this uh, other project I've been working on. And um, one of them is in Brazil, and the other one is in Germany. Um, and I've hired people from, from Poland. I've hired people from, uh, from Russia. Uh, hired quite a few people from America as well. But I'm not concerned about their backgrounds. I look at, at their portfolios and their reels. And over time, you develop enough of an eye to say, that guy's very good. This guy's eh, almost two years, two years more work. This guy will be worth hiring, but not right now. So, so it's inevitable. Bill, we're talking about some destruction in an industry that uh, that not only employs vast numbers of some of America's most highly educated people, but <laughs> also an army of service people at every university, the janitors, the food service people, the physical plant people who care mm -hmm. for the buildings uh, and the HVAC systems and the campus right. police. And there's this whole troop of people that do this. Um, when you've got an organization that has a major line line item for CapEx, in other words, capital expenditures where they're building things, and an organization, mm -hmm. frankly, that mm -hmm. solicits donations from successful alumni by saying, we'll name a building after you. How does an existing organization like that, Cal State, for example, uh, manage to deal with this new reality, or are they in incredibly vulnerable to the scrappy upstart that has, you know, three guys in a website? Uh, I think they're incredibly vulnerable to the scrappy website guys. And I want to say this with crystal clarity. The janitors, the food service people, the maintenance people, the campus police, uh, the, 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 the people, the football coaches or sports coaches as a general rule, um, 
virtually all of the people involved in actually running the university and electricians and water treatment guys, all of them, have my undying respect. But I would take 98% of the professors and deans in the, in the university system in California, and I'd put them on a high-speed rail, rail to hell, to hell with them. These are people that have spent the last 20 years injecting their personal politics into things like astronomy, geology, mathematics. They deserve no respect whatsoever. They deserve no sympathy whatsoever. It is their insistence on intruding their own personal politics in, in, in return for this kind of virtue signaling sort of adulation in the, in basking in the, in the, in the adulation of young minds whose job they should be to challenge, not to not to uh, reinforce stereotypes. They can all get on on the non-existent high-speed rail in California straight to hell. They have no ethical um, core. They have no sense of responsibility. The for for people that so continuously, so egregiously bring their personal politics into the classroom and waste the time of students who are paying them real money to learn things like biology. Not, not like Nancy Pelosi uh, uh, rally, it's a biology class. All of them, at least in the state of California, the huge majority of them, if they're out of work, it could, it could be the best thing that ever happened to this country. Getting those people out of work would be, I think, an enormous benefit for the United States, enormous benefit. Because, they, because as you say, they're people, they're people who have a very deep amount of very narrow knowledge. And they think that because they know um, medieval uh, Italian poetry down to, the, to the, the, the bolts, that they know everything down to the bolts. And they don't. And they think they do. And, and there, is a, there is an attitude among uh, professors, and this has been here from time immemorial, but if you if you want to get a good sense of this, just watch um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which is about college professors. It's an amazing drama, actually just four people in that movie. But there's also a, a deep-seated sense among the people that sit in faculty lounges, a deep-seated resentment that other people like car salesmen are making millions and millions of dollars and they don't know anything about satra or existentialism. And, and, and this runs very deep, this contempt that, that has a traditionally, and I, I mean long for, essentially for the existence of, of academia, this contempt for common people that exists in the ivory tower is, is the kind of contempt that comes from people who really do genuinely make up that old saw that has a lot of truth to it, a lot of truth, and that is those that can do and those that can't teach. And there is a tremendous, I see it, I've seen it in, in so many places, sense of bitterness, you know, that I'm, that I'm reduced to, um, to teaching this stuff when obviously I would have been so much more qualified than, than these uh, idiots that are out there selling cars and so on. Now look, I've had some terrific, terrific professors and they have taught me virtually everything I know, but the enormous majority of those teachers came uh, between the ages of four and 12 in, in British schools, which were extraordinarily disciplined and did nothing but teach the subjects and teach them rigorously. Uh, I've, had, I've had several remarkable college professors, but I'd be willing to bet you that none of them could teach what they taught me. And they're all liberal. None of them could teach what they taught me in, in today's environment in colleges. There's a link in the description below that'll take you to the Patriot Post, America's News Digest, where you can sign up for daily email alerts with some of the best conservative content on the internet and some of the funniest memes, frankly. Uh, when you do nice? that, they're actually going to give you a free copy of the Patriot's Primer on American Liberty. It's a great time to refresh yourself on the foundations of what makes this country great. We encourage you to click that link. We're grateful to the Patriot Post as well as to the members at BillWhittle.com who make all of this possible. If you go to BillWhittle.com right now on the homepage, you'll see a lovely picture of Bill and a big green button that says, become a member. When you click that eject. <laughs> and become a member, you will find that the homepage is transformed <laughs> and you'll see the member written blog. You'll see comments yeah, that were very uh, written by members and you will find that you will have found a family of like-minded people that you enjoy being around. We invite you to do that right now by going to BillWhittle.com and clicking the big green button. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.